Well, I don't know any South African who doesn't know Bold and the Beautiful. It's been around since I was a, a kid. I used to get home from school and it was on TV. And I'll tell you what, I'm not embarrassed to admit, I used to watch that more than I did any homework. And one of the people who's been, in fact, one of only two people who's been on the show from episode one is the man who plays the character Eric Forrester. His name is John McCook. He's been there since episode one back in 1987, which is almost 37 years ago. And his character narrowly escaped death recently, making a lot of headlines. His fans were fearing for his retirement. And he was the recipient just recently, too, of the Daytime Emmy Award for lead actor. That was in 2022 for the first time in his career. He should have got it every year, if you ask me. Here's John McCook. What a pleasure to see you, sir. And you're looking, I mean, you you don't age. I don't know what you're doing here. Where's the well of eternal youth? Where did you discover only, this stuff? You're only seeing the front of me. Uh, everything else is looking pretty bad, but this is the front and this is what works. So this is all we show. I'm not joking though, John, and you must know this. I mean, you've been doing this character for, for 37 years and, and you look the same. You How do you do this? Well, I, you know, that's, uh, you can thank my uh, the genetics from my parents, I guess. I'm lucky to be uh, alive, let alone uh, looking all right. And, and I'm in a job, this job is great because uh, this is a job where being older is a good thing. We need older characters on a soap opera or to, uh, to um, honor the generational aspect of our stories. And so it's not like, okay, I've aged out. I can't be on it anymore. That's not true. We need uh, we need grown-ups on our shows. So I'm very happy to be here. Well, I, I often watch uh, Bill Maher, and he seems to be one of the people who stands up for, the, he says the one category that we're still allowed to be prejudiced about is age. He says, particularly in Hollywood, in particular, well, in America, and then particularly in Hollywood. And I'm glad that you brought that up because I won't make too much of a thing, but <clears throat> you're 79 years old. And that's a that's a that's a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience above all else, right? It's a lot of experience. I don't know how wise, uh, how much wisdom it's imparted, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of experience behind me, and uh, the joy that's the joy of this job. It's different every day. The scripts are different every day. The stories change every ten minutes uh, on on our show, and uh, that's one of the good things about it. So uh, we acquire skill and uh, apply that as much as we can to whatever talent we have and and uh yeah being around for a long time is a good thing i it's it's great to be on a show where young actors come uh in uh and 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 middle-aged actors and older actors come in and have never done it before and they they've done film or they've done a lot of theater uh but they come into our set uh on a soap opera it's very different it's not better or worse than anything. It's just different than, uh, but a good actor can do it. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've been, but it's, uh, it's alarming at first. And it's really fun to have uh, young, young actors come on and, uh, and try to deal with how different it is and to watch them acquire uh, familiarity and to get that. It's really fun to watch. I'll get into to Bold and the Beautiful a little bit later on, and, and also the awards that you've won, the fact that it is now available to stream in South Africa on Netflix, which is, I think, going to be a major game changer. People, as I said at the beginning of this discussion, people just absolutely love that show in this country. I think South Africa is one of those markets where soap operas are the number one and always have been the number one category of shows. And I don't know if that's true anywhere else in the world. There are lots of countries where that probably is true, but we are proper fans of the soap opera. And, you know, you've been in, in two of the ones that we love. Um, uh, Young and the Restless, I think you did as well, and, and, and Bold and the Beautiful, which, I mean, those are two of the biggest names in television. That's, that's, it's, it's great to hear. Yeah, the, the, uh, the success of these shows, and specifically the success of Bold and Beautiful, all over the world has been uh, a, a wonderful gift for all of us, especially in the beginning in 1987, 88, 89. Um, interestingly enough, to be you know talk about the business for a minute, uh, uh, the the when we began in those years in the late 80s, television was being deregulated in a lot of uh, European uh, uh, markets, for instance, and so that meant that these these TV stations were not all owned by government, but we're now being owned by private entrepreneurs and companies. 
and they needed mm -hmm. new products and they wanted um, American product especially. And, uh, and we were half an hour, so we were cheap to buy. We, it wasn't like buying a big one hour show. And uh, we were new and it was glamorous and it was about, uh, LA was about Beverly Hills and the fashion industry. And that made uh, our show unique in all the world and, and provided for an instant, uh, instant popularity in, in places we had no idea. We just wanted to, be, uh, wanted to be on the air in America. And all of a sudden it was international. And, and so the, uh, the success of our show in South Africa is, is uh, exemplary of, of, of what excites us. And, uh, and to see it, it's fun that, that we move <laughs> from place to place apparently in, in, in a lot of different countries. We'll go off one, one network and we'll be gone for two or three months or even for a year and all of a sudden it comes back someplace else. And so uh, this news that, that Netflix is bringing us on the air down there is, is really good news. And uh, uh, we're very happy that you're, you're doing that for us. So thank you very much. Well, uh, we're, we're delighted. Uh, you know, you make um, the character look like he's you. And, and I just wonder, one of, one of our staff actually wanted to ask you a question, a guy called Jack. He wanted to throw this one at you because I, for so many people, you're just synonymous with Eric Forrester. And it must be difficult for you to separate those things out. Uh, maybe it's more difficult for the audience some of the time, but listen to what Jack had to ask you. So here's my question. Given the fact that you've played Eric Forrester for decades, do you still find any challenges with that character? Because by now, I would think that you know the character very intimately. Hmm. Are, are you and Eric one and the same? Well, uh, it seems like it doesn't have, but no, of course we're not. Uh, uh, we're, we're very similar. Um, we share, we share uh, a lot of qualities. I mean, we love, we're family people. We love family. Uh, we're sensitive to other people. We try to be... Uh, but but he's very different. He's made uh, some terrible choices in his life, uh, many more terrible choices than I ever have. Uh, and and so I, I I consider him sort of my best friend. He's a very good friend of mine, and uh, I, I go along all these years with him uh, side by side, and and I watch him make uh, good choices and bad choices, and I I understand his his needs and his. Uh, and his uh, reasons for for making bad choices, um, and, and and making good ones too. So um, I'm particularly right now, although I, I it's a different place in the story for everybody, uh, all from months away and years behind the story. What we're playing now in L.A. But but um, when I when I see him make uh, make the choices in his life and and see him in relationships with his children uh, and, and with his grandkids uh, on the show, uh, it's, it's very fulfilling. But he's not exactly the same as me. No, I'm not the same as he is. We, have, uh, we wear the same underwear, and that's about it. <laughs> well, I mean, the people you've also had work with you have come and gone, and people change, the characters change. Uh, do, do you... As one of the people who really is a stalwart in the show, do you get feedback from the audience? They're like, "Oh, we don't like the new Ridge or Thorn, or we don't like the, the 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 new grandkid or whatever it is that's come into the show." And you have to bear the brunt of that because they think of you as like the pater familias. You know, you're like the the patriarch of the the Forrester family and therefore of the show. Well, it's uh, it's funny because they think uh, they think I make these choices, and of course I don't. But uh, uh, as these as these characters evolve, as as actors come and go, uh, I mean, Susan Flannery, who played Stephanie on the show for the first 25 years, uh, was was the solid rock of the show and a solid rock for me. Uh, there was conflict in every scene, uh, and mm. that's what made it fun to watch. Even when we were doing, I would I would be in a scene with with Stephanie and Eric uh, having martinis in the evening, talking about Ridge's love life. And she would say, well, where's the conflict here? You know, if there's no conflict, why are we watching? And she was right. She, she had uh, a, the best sense of anybody about what it's like to be on a soap opera and, and to keep, uh, keep these characters interesting to watch. Um, and so I, I, uh, I celebrate the 25 years I had with Susan Flannery on the show.
Uh, Ron Moss was there for the same 25 years playing Ridge, the original Ridge. Right. And he and right. Susan left the show right about the same time, uh, within months of each other. And they have both decided in a very positive way to move on uh, to retire from our show. Susan retired from acting. Uh, and, right. and she lives up in Santa Barbara, not too far from here. And, uh, and Ron is off in Europe singing and playing guitar and, and really enjoying his time uh, being, being a, a singer and, and a popular character. So um, the character of Stephanie uh, died off, uh, but, uh, but Ron was recast with Torsten Kay, and I'm very proud to have Torsten on the show playing Ridge now. He's a wonderful actor and a funny, uh, a really fun uh, co coworker. And so uh, I, I just enjoy, uh, I enjoy all of this, all of these people coming and going and, and the young actors who are there for two or three years and then they, they move on because they're excited about moving on to other possibilities. I did that when I was on Young and Restless. I was a young actor on that show. I had never done a soap before. And I spent uh, almost five years there. And when that, that show uh, was half an hour when I was on it, and when it expanded to an hour, I was not obligated to stay. And so I took that opportunity to step out into the world and, and, uh, and to do a, a lot more theater, a, a lot of theater and lots of episodic television and guest starring on, on all the, the, the uh, sort of the, the, what do they call it? The procedural shows and, and the sitcoms. And then seven years later, when, uh, when Bill Bell, our, our original writer, producer, uh, senior, mm -hmm. uh, called me to do this show, um, I said no at first. I said, no, no, I'm busy. I'm doing stuff. I don't need to do another soap. You know, what am I going to do? Another soap opera. And uh, my sure. wife, looked at me, she said, are you crazy? If it fails, it'll run for five years, you know? And uh, <laughs> and then she her, she was right. And of course, it's it's run forever now. It's, it's uh, all these years now. It's, it's it's hard to believe, but it's that is, is is watching other actors come and go from the show. Really wonderful. Do you find because this is true for, certainly for people in this country who've played characters in soap operas that the fans become so wrapped up in the characters that if you play a villain or you make a bad decision, as you put it just now, or you do something on the show, then you get attacked at the grocery store or people think that you are that character in real life. And they, you know, it's, it's part of everybody's day to day existence. And there's so many people for whom that soap opera is a couple of minutes of escapism. I know. Um, I know. It's, it, it's, 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 it's quite wonderful to have somebody come up to you and say, uh, I hate what you did last Thursday. And I go, well, what did I do last Thursday? I can't remember. Uh, it, it, it's fun. Uh, it, it, it's alarming for someone to see to see Eric Forrester walking in the in the deli section of, of the uh, of, of the store, and I understand that. Um, but but that's the fun of it, really. It, it's really it's um, it's it's alarming to see uh, us because we're not we're not separated like movie stars are playing different roles in different projects over the years we are saying these characters forever and ever and uh, there is no separation um it's 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 quite fun it really is so john just talking about serious acting because soap operas are serious acting but i mean you were discovered if i'm to believe this and you can correct it if it's wrong but you were discovered by none other than jack warner yeah jack warner and his uh, and warner brothers um, wow. signed me to contract back when there was a contact system in the studios. Uh, this is in the, the mid, the early sixties. Uh, when I was like 18 years old, uh, I was doing wow. theater in New York and, and, uh, and as, as happens in New York, you know, you, you get to play a part for a few nights or understudy and take over the part and, uh, uh casting people are always, uh, trolling uh theater to see if there are young actors they might want and uh and mm -hmm. warner brothers uh signed me to a contract then and brought me to back, back to la uh, i mean that's la is where i was from southern california so i went to new york to stay in new york and then all of a sudden i was back in back in la again uh so yeah jack i was the last actor to be signed to a contract at warner brothers under the contract system and then they uh 
they stopped doing that anymore. Uh, I'm not sure it was because they signed me that they stopped doing it. But anyway, I, I'm very happy that uh, I, was, I was in that system. And, you know, being a young actor and walking on a movie studio like that and seeing cowboys and Indians running around. and, and uh, Right. Uh, it, it was pretty wonderful. And, and the same thing was true at Universal, where I went later. The same thing, a busy, busy studio with lots of actors and uh, in characters walking around in the commissary and, and on the back lot. Uh, pretty exciting times. I'm sure that must have been the most electric experience. And, you know, even the actors who, who came much later and didn't get to experience that, they sort of harken back to those glory days. And they, they, they tend to see it through rose-tinted glasses. You actually got to experience the, the end of that era. Yeah, really, it was it was quite something, and and the patina that was on those buildings, uh, those sound stages, it still is. The, the old sound stages are still there on on all the studio lots, except they build a lot more of them, and and they're they're more modern. But there there's a, there's a uh, there's a grittiness about the walls of those old studios and and walking between the the big buildings that is uh, that's really fun and. Uh, and and to actually uh, go into the big wardrobe, the big wardrobe uh, building that used to be yeah. there. Now those, they don't have those things anymore. They 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 farm all that out the studios, but the studios had their own their own uh, wardrobes uh, wardrobe departments and and all kinds of military uniforms and 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 period pieces and gowns and suits and and uh, it was really wonderful to walk through. And see all that history from 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 the movies that had been there, you know, thirty years before that and forty years before that. So, so yeah, it was phenomenal. A, it was a big part of that. And speaking of military uniforms, you did serve for two yeah. years and, and then took up your your acting contract after that. Is that is that correct? Yes, I, I was at Universal in the contract. I got drafted uh, during the Vietnam hmm. conflict in uh, nineteen sixty six. It was, and I. I got drafted into the army. I had to leave, uh, and I I, I I went, and uh, <laughs> I, I went through uh, basic training and uh, infantry training, and then I was in radio school, uh, learning to be a radio operator. and And uh, and I realized that every every two weeks, uh, the classes were graduating, and they were getting their orders, and everybody was being sent to Vietnam. And I went, well, I'm not sure I want to go there. So I went up to the 28th Army Band, because I'm a piano player. And I went right. up to the Army Band, and I knocked on the door. I said, sir, you need a piano player. And he said, uh, yeah. Yeah, we do. Do you play? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, do you play Mozart? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, come here. And he, he put a French horn concerto on the piano, and I played it because I could. And... uh and he said, where are you? I said, I'm in radio school. And he said, no, you're not. And he changed my job description right there from radio operator to piano player. And uh, I spent my two years in the Army playing piano and, and doing theater and conducting a choir of uh, a choral of men uh, at Fort Order in California. And uh, the fun of that, <coughs> excuse me, the, the fun part of that story is that in the army, you know, you have short haircut, and 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 right. because I was up at uh, up at Fort Ord on the weekends after we would play on the weekend to graduate people out of basic training in the army band, we were we had we had two days off, so I would come down to L.A. and uh, I would sometimes I would I would go to lunch with my friends at Universal at the at the commissary with my my buddies that had also still be in the contract. They hadn't been drafted, so they were still there. But my hair is really short. This is funny. Jack Webb, <coughs> excuse me. Jack Webb, the actor, the producer, yeah. was, uh, he produced Dragnet, uh, a, a cop show, and yes. uh, about LA cops. And, uh, and, and he, and I had done one of his shows, and, and uh, he, he walked by this table of actors, about four or five of us, and, and they're all there, and I'm there with my short hair. And I'm not in uniform or anything, but I've got short hair. And he still looked at me, and he said, are you doing my show this week? Because we had to cut our hair short to, to do Dragnet. And I said, no. And he said, well, why is your hair short? 
I said, I'm in the army now. He said, what? And I said, I got drafted. I'm playing piano in an army band. He, he thought that was great because he was a piano player and, and loved music. Oh, man. And, and of so course, he was went here. I said, I have the weekends off. And he said, are, are you going to be here next Monday? And I said, yeah. And he said, all right, be in, uh, be in makeup at five o'clock in the morning. I'll, see, I'll give you your sides then and you can do another show. So while I was in the army, uh, I still got to do another dragnet while I was in the army on the weekends because my hair was short. Isn't that cool? Uh, that's that's very cool. And of course, it must have really stood out because it was the same. so everyone had long hair, and you know, especially in California. Uh, of course, of course, and and uh, the, we uh, we hate it. You know, we said, I don't. I hope he doesn't ask me to do a dragnet because I'm going to have to cut my hair. You know, nobody wanted to cut their hair short, so uh, this was uh, this was fun. But that was cool. You know, I got to. I was I was able because of my my piano training and uh, because of my my theater work that I had already done. I was 21 years old when I got drafted, and I had already done like three or four years in 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 the business. And a lot of the young guys that I was in the army with had never been out of their hometowns, and they were more naive about being out in the world than I was. Not that I was worldly, but I was ahead of most guys, and so. Uh, just the idea that I would go down and, and knock on the door of the army band is something most of the guys wouldn't think about because they were just doing what they were told and, and rightly so. So uh, I think my, my skill and my training and what my, my parents gave me as a, as a, young, uh, as a young man really uh, saved my life, maybe. Well, I mean, another extraordinary part of your life i mean there's so many of these shows that you've been on besides bold and the beautiful that i just have to mention because again these are shows that we grew up with in south africa um la law what a show that was sure. incredible i mean it made i i know people who became lawyers just because they watched that show <laughs> i believe it i was in the pilot of that show i played a a, a a nasty guy that was getting a divorce you know and and uh, i wasn't one of the lawyers i was a client but but I was in the pilot of that. I, I didn't get to do it again, but boy, that was fun to be in that pilot. That was great. Yeah. Murder, she wrote. I mean, who can forget Angela Lansbury? It was like part of our week here in South Africa. We 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 knew the theme music when it came on. You just knew someone was going to die. Of course, <laughs> yeah, and someone did. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did two of those, and and uh, wow. the first one I did with her, I had seen her. I had seen her a year and a half or two before that in Sweeney Todd on Broadway. And uh, yeah. and when I came on the set uh, to do it, it was just me and her. It was nobody else. It was in her house, and my character came in, and I talked to her, and 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 we did the scene once, and then and she said, "Fine, darling," you know. And then I said, "I saw you in in Sweeney Todd." She said, "Oh, was I good? Was I good?" And I said, "Yes, you were wonderful." And uh, <laughs> she appreciated so much that, and that that I was from the musical theater too, and uh, it was really fun. It's really fun to know that people who are in a wonderful position like that have um have clawed their way and and marched their way through uh through the theater or through smaller television and movie things to get where they are and and that they don't forget those uh those beginnings and that was fun to share that with her i get back to the list of shows in a minute, but you, you brought up something that I've, I've always wanted to ask an actor who's done all of these things. Um, you know, do, do actors who've done stage, you know, musical theater, theater, that kind of thing, do they kind of look down on the screen actors if they haven't done that? They can. Some do. Uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, some do. But uh, most do not. Uh, because the skills and, uh, you know, when an actor is comfortable and confident, uh, usually they, they come from, from theater and from summer stock and from dealing with, uh, what it's like to have to do a show in one week and then get it up and, and, uh, and, and brave, uh, maybe not being as prepared as you want to be, um, People do look down. People look down on soap operas. You know, I didn't. I will never do a soap, or uh, yeah. I'll never. I'll never do commercials. You know, and then mm -hmm. uh, they say, "Okay, don't." You know, because I, I will. <laughs> and if you don't, that yeah. deletes it for me. So, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, there are those. There are those who are very uh, uh, prejudiced about 
what they do and what other people can work. Yeah, but and protective of it. But that usually comes from an insecure place. Most of the people who are successful and uh, are enjoying success in, in, in film or television or theater are very confident and generous and uh, friendly people, uh, not, uh, not critical of other people at all. You know, there's an, there's an argument to be made that soap acting in particular, when you've done a character for as long as you have in, in Eric Forrester, that you almost become, and I don't know, you're going to have to tell me if this is true or not, but I would imagine that you can trust your instincts a whole lot more. It's almost as if you're, you're playing the world's longest movie role over an extended period of time, and you can really think about that character, and you can watch them evolve, and you can see how they change. And, you know, there's time to, to develop relationships with everyone else on the show, which you don't get to do in most feature films, even if they are long. No, I know. I mean, the big challenge of, of doing a feature film or, or, or doing a piece of theater that's never been done before or, mm -hmm. or a, a classic piece of theater is that you have to, you as an actor have to come up with the history of this character. Uh, you right. have to invent uh, a past life as you try to execute this, these current pages of, of what's happening in the character's life. Uh, we don't have to do that. We have our, our our history is is in our bones, and it's in the uh, the 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 months and months, if not decades, of of show that you've done before. So yes, we don't have to invent a history or a backstory or a uh, subconscious place because we know what that is. We have that history. That's a great gift to be on the soap opera to to take that kind of work out of it. And then to just come and execute each day what we're doing together. Uh, and when, when you say you're working with other people, you know, we have a, there's always a company of 12 or 14, uh, 10 or 12 actors who are in the contract of the show at any given time. And then other actors that are jobbers that come in and out and in and out and aren't under contract. But we develop, we develop very serious, long, long standing, uh, relationships with each other. Uh, I, I don't mean serious, that sounds like it's very serious. I don't mean that. Very, uh, really wonderful uh, whole uh, relationships. And it's because we, we, we know and love each other. We, we depend on each other for our own work. I mean, if, if I'm not doing my work, then, then it, it reflects on somebody else's work that day. It's very much like sports. It's like playing tennis. Uh, you're, your game is better when you play with someone who's better than you are. Your game comes up. And so we, um, we depend on each other for good work and for, for being there and, and, and really uh, not bringing in the outside world, but coming in, closing the door, and doing our work every day and then going back to our lives. Uh, and so that's when, when we have stories that are love stories or, or family stories. Um, when we have, I've just been doing a long, a long story arc where Eric becomes very ill and then he, you know, and, yeah. and he's going to die, you know, and it becomes um, a scary, scary time for all the characters. And, uh, and, and when we play these scenes together, uh, we actually feel these things about each other. And so uh, it's, it's very rich and full to do that work. Really nice. Do you? I mean, you were, you mentioned Susan, who played Stephanie for such a long time, your wife on the show, and, and, then, and then later on Ridge. You know, you you mentioned Ron Moss and how important he had become in the story. And I can't help thinking because I really did watch the show. I know a lot of people who interview you, you, you probably just you think they oh well, you know. They, 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 I watched this show, and I remember you used to have the most insane on-screen chemistry with uh, the woman who played Sally Spectra, Darlene Conley. I mean. Yeah. Because you guys, you guys used to fight, and it was you know it was this big war between the Foresters and the Spectres, and she was like this up and coming designer in the show, and she was such an interesting character because she was sometimes a villain, and then you felt sorry for her, but you and she seemed to have had a, a lot of fun on on screen together too. Is that how it was? Yes, it is how it was. I, one thing about about Darlene Conley, God bless her, um, she, I, I used to love when I'd come in in the morning. And be walking down the hall to the makeup. You know, it's, it's morning. 
It's like 6.30 yeah. in the morning or 7 o'clock, <laughs> and you're coming down, and you would hear her voice. She would be in a makeup chair way down the hall, and she's going, darling, this and darling, that, and blah, blah, blah. And just She had a funny, funny way of talking, and, and uh, yeah. she never stopped talking. And, and I would remember when I heard her voice, I would go, oh, yes, I'm in show business. I forgot. She, right. she had a thing in her. She was like, it was vaudeville. It was burlesque. It was theater. It was movies. It was everything uh, coming out of her at all, at all times. There was a great energy and a great humor in her. And so she was uh, absolutely wonderful fun to work with. And then later, she got very, uh, as she got older, it was uh, a little more difficult for her to remember lines or to do them exactly right. And so she, would, yeah. she if you were in a scene with her, she would start the, start the line and then she would go off, off track. And she would be talking and talking, and you you didn't know when when it was your turn to talk again because she wasn't doing the lines <laughs> anymore. And you'd wait for your cue, and by God, at the end of the rant, she would put the cue in there, and you knew, okay, it's time for me to talk again. She was great fun that way, and uh, and I think everybody enjoyed, uh, uh, even the directors who who didn't know what to do with her, they would just stay on her and wait till she was finished, and uh, right and go with her. Yeah, there was great joy in that woman. Great joy. Uh, you, you just mentioned the actual process and like waking up early in the morning, going to the set. It, a lot of people might not know this, but obviously you record as much as you can chronologically, but sometimes you have a scene that fits in like, you know, you, you're recording three weeks, three months, sometimes or however many weeks in advance. Um, it's sometimes difficult to put all of those together if you're just a viewer because we just see it as it's meant to play out once the producers and editors and the rest of them have got hold of it. But how many days a week and what kind of hours do you work on a soap opera like this? What, what How intense is the actual workload? Well, it, the actual workload is intense, but the work hours uh, uh, generally are not that bad. We start shooting at nine o'clock in the morning, not at four o'clock, like some things, you know, when things are mm -hmm. on film, they depend on sunlight and being outdoors and all that. Right. So they have to get ready before the sun comes up so they can use the sun if they're outdoors. Uh, we don't do that. We, we, uh, the earliest calls are, are like six or six thirty uh, for the women, because there's more hair, there's hair to do and, and so on and makeup. Uh, right. And then we, we start shooting at nine o'clock in the morning there's a lunch break at noon and then we we should finish theoretically we should finish by six or six thirty uh every evening well you have to remember we're a half hour show so we're we're shooting well we're shooting everything from one or two episodes each day all everything we can uh and and as chronologically as we can uh we don't usually uh once in a while we have to pre-tape or post-tape a scene because someone's not available or the set isn't there or something and we can't shoot mm -hmm. these scenes until next week so you have to remember and keep the script and you know you have to just keep your brain wrapped around what we're doing and where the line goes and and where these little moments are um but that's that's part of fun of it too you know just trying to execute and um once in a while we'll have a long day because it's a wedding or there's a fashion show and there's more people and there's a complicated set and uh, right. it takes longer to shoot. And we know that there's going to be longer days. That's all. But uh, by and large, it's a, it's a wonderful job. And uh, um, it's not as demanding as, as I think some of these police procedural shows that are on oh, film. Yeah. They use multiple cameras now like we do, but, but they still have to be outdoors and there's cars and there's, there's traffic to deal with. And, and, and they have to start, they start shooting at seven in the morning or six. And they're there sometimes till six or seven or eight o'clock at night too. And then they go home and sleep and have to do it again. And it takes five or six days to shoot uh, an episodic, a, a one hour show, very much more demanding than in, in terms of time uh away from home and your family uh sure. than, than our show is yeah much more demanding is there any improvisation on a show like this because you mentioned with darlene that she would sometimes go off on a tangent and then come back and you 
you'd get your cue on time eventually, but she was a professional about it. I mean, do you, do you ever improvise? Because you, you've made Eric this, this real character. You can, no, you no, could probably I, give you a yeah, little bit of leeway. No, improvisation is, is the wrong word. We don't improvise. Uh, yes, she did, but she did with great humor. And, and it was very unique to have an actor uh, go off book like that. Uh, we don't we don't improvise, but we can, and we do have almost a pre, uh, we almost have a, a permission to paraphrase. Um, okay. The writers will will write broad strokes, uh, and and give give uh, the the head writer Brad Bell will give will give um, uh, an outline to the writers who are going to write that episode, and then the writers write the dialogue, the actual dialogue, and. One of the shortcomings I feel of our show and and and, and any daytime show is that uh, the the dialogue is is not the best thing they write. The best thing they write are the stories and the plots mm. and the character descriptions and so on. Those are the best things they do. The dialogue itself, you know, I, I'll go off track for a second. In a good piece of theater, for instance, if it's a, if it's uh, Arthur Miller or, or, or Tennessee Williams, uh, if you take all the characters' names off the pages and you start mm -hmm. reading these pages of a play, you can tell who's talking pretty soon because people speak differently. Um, the, the words that, that this character uses and the phrases that this character uses are different than the ones that, he does, that another one does. And pretty soon mm -hmm. you, can, you can tell good writing because there's there's very specific dialogue for each uh, and style for each each uh, character, um, and so when you get a sometimes when you get a soap script, the actors are all the characters are all talking the same, mm -hmm. and, and so we uh, after you've been there a while, it's not a mandate and it's not permission given to everybody, uh, and it's not encouraged at first, but it evolves that that you can and do paraphrase a little so that it's more like eric or it's it's more like uh it's more like brooke would say it or it's more like steffi would say it than, right. than what they actually wrote different they, the writers will write you know four adjectives in <laughs> in a sentence um uh rather than uh, just one and and uh, we try to simplify and and make more uh and, and Taylor make these sentences to fit each uh, to fit each character. But no, we don't ad lib. We, that makes it impossible for a director, for instance, to uh, to call the shots because right. they have a script and that's where they've done their homework. They've they've prepared to shoot the show as it's written. And if he has a big paragraph and then two short lines and then another paragraph, that's where it needs to stay because that's how we're going to cut the show. That's where right. they're going to cut with the uh, with the cameras, and so you can't go so far afield that nobody can cut the show either. We have to. We forget that young actors can be on the show and be on the show for months and not having gone in the booth. And and you have to go. You haven't been in the booth. You don't see what's going on. And and these right. actors have to come into the the booth and see where the director and the producer and 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 and. Um, and the associate director and everybody are keeping. They're timing it. They're looking at it. They're they're choosing shots. They're they're editing in their heads and they're preparing so they can take they can take what we shot that day in a big pile and take it downstairs to be edited together. And hopefully uh, they've 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 been able to um, shoot it in a way that it, uh, they don't have to come up with a, a lot of new editing ideas. They know how they want to cut it together. But uh, actors forget that there are uh, uh, there are a dozen people in the booth trying to uh, trying to get it together so they can make the product the, the finished product. And we think we're the finished product, but we're not. We're not. Not at all. John, um, how has the show changed as an as an actor? Because thirty seven years is a long time. The world has changed so much in thirty seven years. Do you ever find that? The script writing changes to keep up with new ideas, with social norms, with 
uh, developments in technology with developments, commercial imperatives for the show must change too from time to time. How has that changed from your point of view as a long running character? Well, I know that our show, for instance, we, we try, all shows try to, uh, to write about social conflict as it's happening, not politics really, because politics change all the time. And, uh, we, we can't talk about that because that's not going to be true six months from now or a year from now. But uh, social um, social uh, um, arguments that people have about, uh, about abortion, for instance, or, or about, uh, about uh, same-sex marriage, for instance, or uh, uh, those, those, those particular um, um, uh, things in, in our society, uh, are things that we like to we like to investigate, and because they're emotional cool. and it, it creates a, a, a backdrop for good drama and exciting drama to watch, and it, it becomes stuff that your audience can uh, agree with or disagree with, uh, which is good. That's what we want people to be engaged with the show that way. Um, so uh, our show is constantly trying to uh, write about ideas that are that are in conflict out there in the world as far as um you know there have been technical changes but that those are those are you know electronics and and and, and lenses and and things like that right. i mean the show the show it, it took a while for us to go digital we were we were still on videotape at the beginning and and then digital recording became in and we threw all the tape out you know we don't have to do tape anymore i mean that's just <laughs> That's just, that's not nothing to do with me, but that's the way that is. And the audio skills and talent and, and uh, techniques that, that we use are different. Uh, I, I know that there are some soaps that, that use uh, remote cameras that don't have a cable, you know, running down on the yeah. floor anymore. But we still have cable on the floor, which is great. Uh, uh, and and they uh, some of the some of the news things for instance have cameras that are remotely controlled and there's no guy there's not a cameraman uh, listening to the director and having to look through the camera all the time uh it's it's a remote controlled sort of thing you can do that with with news sort of uh shows or talk shows i guess uh but it's not something you can do with with uh, the drama but those those kind of technical things have changed you know, we're we're working in a big old building. It's called Television City in Hollywood. It's a it's a big old building that was built in 1950, I think three, 54, and it was the first building in America built for television production. Uh, really, fifties the uh, they used to do TV from from theaters or from from uh, film studios or from warehouses or whatever. They just or radio radio studios, you know, and uh, put mm -hmm. cameras in there and shoot stuff. But this was a building that was built for television. So it had big, wide spaces so you could build sets and you can move cameras around on their wheels. And and, uh, and they had fly space like in a theater where you could bring in set pieces and 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 uh, and, and drops and, and scrims and stuff like that. Very cool. Um, we're still Amazing. in that building. And, and some of the wiring is still hanging in the walls, you know, and you'd like, oh, my God, you know. Great big electronic <laughs> plug things, you know, that you go, what? And, and of course, now everything's transistorized and you don't need any of that anymore, except we're still using it because it hasn't worn out. Um, right. And so there's they, a, they, made, they made it good. They made stuff well in those days. Yeah, and, they did. And, the, and the electric, <laughs> you know, you can walk by a great big electric uh, uh, installation there on the wall. And there's a there's a, a, a scent. There's a smell of electronic electronics <clears throat> it's not burning it's not like something's on fire but it's you can smell electricity going through uh some of this stuff in the walls it's pretty cool and and the walls are insulated with with foam not foam it, foam is new it's insulated with cotton wads and stuff and fabric and then they cover it and put put chain uh put put wire on it to hold it in place for sound to deaden sound so that you can't right. hear stuff coming from outside. I mean, all these old techniques are really wonderful. Um, so we're in this old building where things, a lot of things have not changed. And uh, as they do change, 
the old stuff still is there. They don't tear it out. It costs too much money to tear it out, so they just leave it there. Pretty cool. I believe you've even got a South African connection. I mean, one of your ex-wives apparently was, she lived here for a while or something. Have you ever been to South Africa? I have. One of my ex-wives, it sounds like there are four ex-wives. That's interesting. <laughs> I didn't mean to make it sound like that, I promise. Thank you. Juliet Thank you. I have ex-wives. Yeah. You know, I don't know how many ex-wives I have on, on Bold and Beautiful, but in my real life. No. I was probably confused by that. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, my, my late... Uh, uh, ex-wife was from South Africa. And so, uh, yes, uh, a couple of, uh, two or three years uh, in the early 70s, I, I came down. This is, oh, that's 50 years ago, you know. I uh, yeah. came down there to visit her family with her uh, at Christmas time. Uh, and so yeah. that's my experience with Umschlanger Rocks in Durban. And, uh, wow. and uh, <laughs> where did they live in? Outside of Joburg. It lives uh, in a place called uh, Vanderbilt Park. I don't know. If wow. You, know. Uh, oh, you, just, you just won over fans who already loved you even more. <laughs> I, 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 was, uh, I was thrilled to, to uh, be so far away from home and, and, uh, and see your beautiful country. Oh, my God. Uh, it was so wonderful to be down in Durban and, and, uh, at, at Christmas time in the summer and when it was warm down there in the winter. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, experience for me. And my oldest son, Seth, mm -hmm. has uh, cousins in South Africa. That, and oh. so he and his wife and children have visited there. I think they were there uh, less than a year ago. They, they go Fantastic. every three, three or four years. They go back down and visit their cousins. It's fun. I haven't been since. I know that, so. I know that, uh, that, that Catherine Kelly Lang uh, Brooke has been here a couple of times. And uh, she's also just been blown away by how many South Africans know everything about Brooke Forrester. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's the fun of it. it. It's truly fun when we go, I mean, we can go anywhere in the world and, uh, yeah. and especially those of us that have been on the show a long time and, and yeah. it's like being a movie star. It's, it's, uh, it's actually uh, as thrilling as it is. It's annoying as well, but, but it, it's really fun <laughs> to be in a, to be in an airport, uh, waiting waiting room in, in in an airport somewhere in an international city and have people come running up to you from across the room and say oh my god i can't believe i'm seeing you you know really fun really really wonderful yeah well i i i don't know if you've thought about this you mentioned how you know eric gets very sick in a current story arc that you're on and um and he makes it but people were very worried that this was their their moment to kill you off have you ever thought about how eric might exit no i haven't uh, and that's that's up to them if if i ever decide not to be here or if they ever choose to get rid of me uh that'll be up to them uh this this would have been uh a good way to do it. That's why people believed that it was really happening yeah. because right. it was an illness that went on forever, and it gives it gives all the other characters time to uh, to uh, mourn and to talk to him and to uh, to we we have a joke uh, we have a joke here. Uh, the Emmys are our awards that we give out, you know, for acting awards on the soaps yes. and yes. the daytime Emmys. And so the joke is, if you're if you're in a character in a coma and you're laying in a bed for three weeks and you don't have any lines or anything, you're in a coma. And then everybody else on the show pulls up a chair and works on their Emmy reel. They they sit up and they 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 emote like crazy, and then you're sitting there waiting for them to be done for the day. So uh, that uh, that's kind of what's funny about it. Um, well, you. You just recently won a daytime Emmy, so congratulations on that. Uh, yeah, do, do these awards you. mean? Do these awards mean anything to you? Um, are they important to you because it's recognition from the industry, it's recognition from the fans, it's recognition from the academy? Yeah, in that, case? of course, uh, of course. I, I, you know, I'm I'm very cavalier about that sort of thing. Uh, have always been, and I've been nominated a couple of times and not won. And you go, that's fun, and it's a, it's a party always, and a chance to mm. dress up and do the red carpet again and to and to actually meet and get to know or see again actors on other soaps because we don't know each other uh uh but we're aware of who we are and then we get to say hello to one another so that's fun but but to actually win it i was i was uh i was affected by it more than i thought i would be and i was very grateful for it so 
yeah, it's pretty cool. And when you have a, when you have a good, good, solid storyline, especially if you're you know creeping up on eighty years old, uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a rarity uh, to get the kind of scenes that uh, that get submitted by the show uh, to uh, to put you in the running for something like that. And and so I'm not uh, I'm not as cavalier about it as I used to be. You know, you mentioned how, how, you know, these things do matter and they do mean something. And it's actually quite beautiful when people do give you the recognition, especially if you've been doing it a long time, because you, you could be, they could just take you for granted after a while. They're like, oh, well, you know, John's there and we, and we can rely on him as one of the, the kind of main masts of the show. Um, I know when movie actors complete a project or when they're, they're in the middle of something, they sometimes get to, I don't know, keep a piece of the set or anything like that. Have they ever given you, um, like funny things, artifacts that you've kept? Is there anything from this show that you kind of treasure besides things like the awards, which obviously you'd put somewhere? Well, I, you know, I can't, uh, when you finish a movie, you <clears throat> finish a movie, you can steal one of the props because they don't need it anymore because they're going to be done. Yeah. The only thing I get is like a, you know, forest or creations cup because that's, um, I can do that. Oh, that's great. Just show but, that off again. I think that's probably worth uh, that. To, to yeah, fans of the show, that would be a very uh, special thing. Forest to creation is beautiful. And, and uh, it's, it's just funny. Um, but no, uh, there's nothing I've said, you know, Pieces of clothing, I, I could admit here. <clears throat> I will admit here that I have a suit and a sport coat that belonged to Eric Forrester, and it's been hanging in my closet for at least ten years. Um, and that's uh, the. Uh, I have to admit that I've stolen it, which is not right. Yeah. And and I have uh, to. Well. Admit that I can't even wear it anymore because it's too skinny. So, <laughs> well, I think uh, you need to take it back so somebody else can wear it. But I think I think that's a scant compensation for your your dedication to this yeah. role. <laughs> I absolutely agree. I absolutely yeah. agree. I mean, for God's sake, you're meant to be the, you know the the great Eric Forrester. You own a fashion label. You should have some uh, some flashy stuff to occasionally. Yeah, I should. You know, it's yeah. funny. My my wife uh, laughs. She, you know, I go to work and I I have Eric Forrester's uh, clothes. And, his suits and his his sport coats and everything, and he's uh, he's all he's shaven and he his hair is not yeah. sticky. He's all done. And then I come uh-huh. home and she she says, "Look at this." She goes, "Yeah, you you go over you go to work. You're Eric Forrester, and I, when I come home, I'm Herb. Uh, I got Herb." <laughs> and they go, "Yeah, that's what you got." So I'm Herb at home. You know, it's Levi's and a t-shirt at home most of the time, and uh, and all the glamour is there. And so it's interesting that I don't have. I don't have a lot of uh, dressy clothes. I don't. I have one suit that I wear uh, when we go out. If uh, if I need to wear a suit, uh, I'm in Southern California. We don't, you know. There's right away. It's uh, it's it's Beautiful. more casual, and uh, mm. I don't need a suit for anything except for weddings and funerals. You know. So there you go. Right. And and uh, your wife is also an actor. Mm-hmm. Yes, Lorette. Lorette, uh, my wonderful Lorette. Was it was acting in Battlestar Galactica uh, when nice. we met in the late seventies? Uh, she was doing Battlestar, the first Battlestar Galactica at Universal when we met, and we had the same public relations people, and so we we met going to different events, and uh, uh, we fell in love, you know. And so and and we did a couple of things together. She did a lot of episodic TV too. She did like you yeah. know all that she did. She was in the pilot for Happy Days, and she was on Happy Days. Oh, a few times. And, and she was in uh, Love Boat, like I was in a lot of those shows. And um, and so yes, and we did we did a Magnum PI together. We we did a lot of stuff together. Right. And then um, then we started our family, and and we got to the point. She got to the point where she said, you know, I I want to stay home and take care of the kids. And we were lucky. Uh, we were l- lucky enough that she didn't have to if she didn't want to. And she made the choice to stay home with the kids, and she has. And so now um, she's my, my stay-at-home actress. You know, it's wonderful. Well, look, you, 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 can, you can own the, 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 the great accolade that you've been a working actor all of your life, which is something even, you know, some of those people who, who maybe 
household names all over the world as well who may have been in feature films and things they didn't have consistent work the whole time so it's it's quite cool that you could live a in inverted commas normal life while doing and pursuing your craft to the degree that you have it's it's quite a special thing and i know i've yeah. kept you for i've kept you for almost an hour and i promise i won't keep you much longer but i'm i'm having a lot of fun kind of getting into the bones of how this all works because where else do you get to talk to someone with the the amount of experience and and the kind of 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 uh, of, of stories that you've got do your family uh, do your kids and and your grandkids uh, do do they like the fact that uh, you're Eric Forrester half the time? Do they introduce you to people that way? I mean, how does it work in the family? Or are they kind of like that's just dad's job? That's just dad's job. That's exactly right. Uh, they they've grown up seeing you know there's dad on TV. That's not a big deal at all. Uh, right. It's 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 taken for granted as you say, uh, and and that's great. On the other hand, uh, they they appreciate very much what I do. I've taken them to it when they were little. They used to come to the studio with me. They see, they've seen what we do uh, and how how it gets done, and so uh, it's not a mystery to them at all. And uh, and and our youngest, uh, my daughter Molly, is an actor, and she's uh, yes. she's in her thirties, and and she's uh, she has she's getting she's very successful in town. She's beautiful, and she's tall, and she's funny, and she's a good actor, and. Uh, so she's been working, and uh, and uh, there it is. Right? Everybody, the kids get it. They get it, you know. And well, there's a lot of you know they they went to school here in L.A. and so there were a lot of kids whose dads and moms are uh, writers and producers and, right. and and costumers and hairdressers and you know people that are involved in our business one way or another. So it's not it's not like you grew up in like Des Moines, Iowa or something, you know. <laughs> Well, we've come full circle by you saying that your daughter inherited those good genes that you have, that um, may she have a, as, as long and distinguished a career as you have. It's such a pleasure to speak to you, John, and thank you very much for, for making your time available to us. I think there are so many people in South Africa who really just absolutely love what you do, and uh, they will remain fans until the last episode that Eric's in. And I think by the time that they get to Eric's last episode, they should call the show a day, frankly. Oh, yeah, I absolutely agree. Look, we're very, very grateful. I'm very grateful to do your show. Thank you. And, and I'm, I'm very happy that, uh, our, you know, our show gets take, it goes off the air, and then it comes back somewhere else. And coming again, it comes. Yeah. So people are always saying, where is it? Where is it? And I'm so glad that, it's, uh, that Netflix is, is providing it for, for the South African viewers. We're very excited to have you all there. And, and uh, loving the show as much as you do. I hope we get to shoot there. We should come and shoot some episodes there of the big fashion show in Cape Town or something. Absolutely. That would be great. Yeah. I'll, I'll speak yeah, to talk to, those, uh, talk to those producers. Tell them to kind of spend some money and bring you all here. All right. Be... <laughs> John, thank you so much. And what a pleasure. And of course, as, as he's just said, The Bold and Beautiful, now available on Netflix in South Africa for people who just can't get enough of this show. And uh, good luck to you, sir. And I hope you continue to have all the fun that it seems that you are having and, and doing the wonderful stuff that you do. Thank you. And you too. Uh, continue success for you and your show. Yeah. Thank you, sir.